And I'm finding Sandra and Bernard will come to talk to network. Um, and I've had a love of plants, wild plants, really, since I was a small child. I've been gardening from an early age, and I'm a permaculture practitioner. I've been practicing permaculture for about 16 years. Um, and I've been studying the nectar plants specifically for about three years. Um, uh, so as part of the work we do with the um, permaculture group, uh, we've been holding a nettle fest um, for the last three years. Um, so nettles are an abundant natural resource. Um, they grow all around us without any intervention from man. Um, and it's something we can make use of and harvest in one form or another at all times of the year. Um, and it's a plant we can forage for as opposed to having to prepare the ground and sow the seed and wait. Um, it's extremely disease resistant uh, and largely unaffected by changeable weather. You know, you can see nettle will still be growing on frost in the heat, it'll still be growing, it can have green fly, it'll still be growing. And in fact, I've observed, I am seeing it around here in Wales, I saw um, it get to gold, so I took a little fly. Um, and again, it had that and it was, um, it wasn't bothered mm -hmm. at all. Um, I saw that. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've never seen yeah. it before, Steve. The beetle is hot, Yeah, well, I just saw the gall, the white gall, because I wasn't sure what it was at first, and then I looked into it. Yeah, it's um, a little, it's just a really good example. I took talk natural cycles because that's mad. They burrow in, lay the eggs, they grow, and then another lot comes along and eat bet the same fly. And eats them and lays its eggs right there. <laughs> yeah, that's nature for you. So, yeah. Fantastic. You're going to go and draw some nettle. Are you bored of nettle? That's a bored of nettle. Um, so, yeah, um, nettle's extremely high in nutrients and it's really steeped in history. It's one that our ancestors made many uses of and they're still very relevant today. Uh, in the British Isles we have three native species of nettle, um, not to be confused with the dead nettle, which I don't know if any of you are aware, um, it can often have a variegated leaf, the dead nettle, and it has a purple flower and a white flower, and that's a completely different family. Not at all. Um, so we have Urtica urbans, which grows about 50 centimetres, it's quite a low growing one, quite vibrant green and always looks quite juicy. Like before I knew it was a different type, I always used to think it looks like a real fresh, vigorous growth of nettle. Um, there's Urtica conferia, which is also known as the Roman nettle. Um, that's an annual, it grows to about a metre high. Um, and that actually has global seed heads. In fact, it's not actually that common. It is the one the Romans brought over. Um, apparently, I'd love to see one of these put the word out on social media. I think coastal areas are basically the so it likes to line soil. Um, and then Urtica dietica is the one we most commonly see, which is the one we generally see all around us and um, grows up pretty tall. Um, and uh, yeah, it has this, the, obviously the stings and the stems are quite square. Um, from my research, those three that we have in this country, they're interchangeable, so when I talk about um, edible use and also herbal use, um, either three of those will, will be able to be used. Adapt to you know, hopefully humans can learn quite a bit from that, really. 
Um, yeah, I'll put there. It's difficult to explain in words. It's something sort of through observation, you know, wild plants like that that you can really sort of get into. So there's many benefits to in wildlife terms, nettles used for food and protection by many insects. Um, there's um, particular species of butterflies and moths, um, lace wings, parasitic wasps, and also ladybirds. I know that's where me and my brother used to always go to the nettle when we were looking for ladybirds when we were kids. Um, and it's also used for protection um, by mammals and small birds. Um, in terms of gardening, um, it's well, first of all, um, we use it as an indicator plant because nettle will only grow where there's phosphorus and nitrogen in the soil. So when you're planning a garden and deciding what to put where, you know that that soil is actually good soil. It's, it's weird, really, because you think of nettle as growing in scrub ground, but doesn't it will have to be nutrient rich for it to grow there. Um, so you can often see, I know my friend lives in Kenilworth um, and he neighbours a farm that grows corn and you can see from the nitrate runoff which is actually the feed the farm has been giving so you wouldn't really want to eat the nettle from there but it's abundant, the nettle all round those fields because of that runoff. Um, it can be made into plant food, much the same as comfrey, or I always use a mix of comfrey and nettle. Um, it can also be made into an insecticide and a fungicide, because um, it is antibacterial nettle. So I have used it to ward off green fly. That was actually quite successful, although again these things are variable because it did rain, so that would have knocked some off, you know, if I wasn't. wasn't um, and also, yeah, it gets any kind of mildew on plants. I think it would probably even be beneficial as like a fungal feed um, as well. Um, it can be used as a mulch or a green manure because, again, it's the plant itself is rich in nitrogen. So I've used it in to just cut it and drop it or cut it, put it around things. Um, and it is a compost activator as well, so it will speed up the composition on your compost when you put it on there as well. Um, and also it makes really good animal fodder. Um, so dried, you would have to um, dry it and then give it to the animals. Um, I do occasionally give my cats to metal tincture in these bottles and it's very healthy. <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously if you are going to harvest them, if you're going to harvest them to eat, it has to be spring or very early summer growth. Um, as the plants grow, they develop like a gritty particle called cicillates um, and they can irritate the kidneys. So, um, yeah, just when the plants are quite small or if they've grown up a little bit, take the first three leaves or so, but before flowering, definitely, once they've gone into flower, you can't eat them. Um, so it really is like nature's natural multivitamin. Um, it's high in protein. It actually contains more protein than any other plant. It's 40, uh, 30 to 40% 40 of its weight is protein. Um, it's made up of 9 to 21% fibre, 4% um, fats, and 19 to 29% 20, ash. So the vitamin content is A, C, D, F, K, and P. Um, it's got vitamin B complexes, so it's got thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and B6 that are all found in um, high levels, and obviously they are um, antioxidants. Um, it contains 16 free amino acids, um, as well as um, a number of carotenoids, lutein, and some of the other plants. It's a bit wrong. Um, and it actually has more beta carotene than carrots. Um, it's got high content of minerals, zinc, iron, magnesium, and copper. It's got selenium, boron, bromine, calcium, chloride, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, chromium, sodium, iodine, and chlorophyll. Um, and yeah, our chlorophyll is kind of like <coughs> plant's blood. You know, it's very similar to our own blood, nettle's really rich in it. There's only one molecule difference between chlorophyll and human blood. Um, right, so yeah, well, eating, 
Um, unfortunately, being the time of year, what I've tended to do to talk is bring fresh leaves because that will give you the most nutrient kick to roll up a leaf and chew it and eat it fresh. Um, and the nutrients are actually water soluble, so it's a bit out of calcium, it's very accessible to the human body as well. So, um, but yeah, wrong time of year, so we can't do that. I have well, put on some tea. I have to say, although I love nettle, I'm going to go on to try giving it tea. Um, it's, it's not massively palatable in tea. I'm guessing it's because it's the iron content, to be honest. So what I would normally do, I do grow other herbs as part of the other stuff I do. So, um, yeah, I'll put chamomile with that, thinking I was coming on before the meditation. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, there you go. So I'll just, I don't know if people want to know the best way to do it. Yeah, I'm here just for a little taste of for everyone. Yeah. Um, so also you can make it into a green powder, so you can dry the nettle and grind it till it's fine. Um, and you can also gather some nettle and juice that, then add it to the powder and put it in the dehydrator so then it will be preserved. Um, the green powder as well, if anyone is into making their own capsules, herbal capsules, anything like that, you can go on and put them in, use them in caps, put them in caps, machine. Is there nettle in this? Nettle in this? Yes, yes, that's nettle and chamomile. Oh, this one has yeah. yeah. But what I would tend to do is I do make up nettle teas for the nutrient content, for the flavour. Nettle soup is lovely. Again, the, the homing, high in iron benefits it then. It's a bit, the only thing I can compare to is asparagus. I can asparagus soup, it's quite nice. But yeah, holy in a tea, it's quite just sort of bland and tasting. But I think you can get a bit of a metallic, and I think that's the iron. So I usually blend it with um, other herbs. But, um, right, so yeah, um, basically, if anyone's worried about the sting, the sting's like a fiberglass cook. So you can, um, you just cook it, and after a couple of minutes, it breaks down, and then it's um, perfectly fine. Did you say that while you were fresh leaves? And yeah, that is a bit, ooh, you have to take responsibility for your own, you know. I mean, because nettle's very variable, basically what you need to do is just literally observe the leaves. Sometimes nettle doesn't have any stings yeah. under it. Sometimes they're under and not on. And again, it's just because it's such a variable plant. So the, the way you eat it fresh like that is roll it up into the fork with a pink here, yeah. and then just chew it. And then generally you're not going to get stung. Obviously, I can't be held to <laughs> um, Sorry, can I say, would it be as nutritious as a, like a tea then, as if you ate it? Ate it? Uh, well, I would suggest, I mean, again, it would be something really, Andrew, you'd have to kind of look into because new, the nettle nutrients are water soluble, so when you're having them in a tea, they are really accessible in the water. That's been dried, so perhaps the way it was nettle, but that are grown locally at high peak, so. But there will have been a slight depreciation probably sure. in nutrients. Again, depending on your drying method, I mean that's made quite green, so I'd say my drying method there is pretty good. Okay. Um, but then again, there's also these benefits. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Frank Cook, he's amazing and he was a massive component of wild plants and foraging. There's a lot of his videos on YouTube. He does do a great one about nettles. And there's that element of picking something, one, from your immediate environment. It's a bit like that follow-on from you know how local honey really is the better honey that's beneficial to you. It's not really any point getting honey from Australia because we don't live in Australia and it's not going to be of any benefit or be a benefit to people who live in that area. So it's that same thing again, you know, and then yeah, again it's fresh, so you literally straight in there, no depreciation of nutrients. So. Um, so yeah, the seeds as well, um, we use, I've got some here, I should be able to have a look at. The seeds are quite tiny, you'll find it, you can see them green, that's in the husk. But the husk has nutrient content as well, um, and then again the seeds inside. Um, but in herbal terms, 
in herbal terms, um, they are really, really good for you. They're strengthening and they're mineral rich. So um, for any kind of fatigue or they work on the adrenals. Um, they're really good for the skin and the hair. Um, they support kidney and the urinary system. Um, so the, whereas the leaf is slightly gentler, the seeds pack more of a punch and they have got um, trace elements. They've got omega-3, omega-6 and essential fatty acids. Um, so they've actually been quite a lot of serious um, studies done into the composition of nettles. Um, I'll give you a bit of information, but I have actually got a shared um, file on Mega, it's a saved cloud storage system, um, which if you want to join that, you can um, email me and I'll join you on there, and that's I've got all the sort of nettle studies that I find in there, so that goes into the real nitty gritty detail. Um, you know, a lot of them are done by universities, things like that. Um, but yeah, there are basically there are more than 50 different chemical constituents of nettle. Um, and the roots of stinky nettle have actually been studied extensively. Um, so yeah, I said they uh, contain about 4.8 milligrams of chlorophyll per gram of dry leaves, <laughs> depending on whether the plant is growing in the sun or the shade. But Amazingly, there's more chlorophyll and carotenoids in plants that grow in shade. This shows you how amazingly variable plants are and how really there's no, we think we know stuff, but we actually don't really know about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, the dried leaf contains 40% protein. It's one of the highest sources of protein in um, a leafy green. Um, and um, yeah, they actually, because of the amino acids in dehydrated nettle meal, um, they are considered nutritionally superior to that of the farmer. Um, they also, the leaves contain tannic and gallic acids and gum and wax. Um, they've looked at the dried flowers for nutrient content um, and they contain added, added things again. Um, and then you move on to the sting, um, which as I said, they're like tiny hollow hairs uh, called trichomes. Um, so basically when you brush against them, they're, what, they're made of silica, so it's like a little injection, that, that's what's happening. Um, but um, they're, they're basically, it's neurotransmitters, what, what it's injecting you with. Um, it's got histamine in um, so ironically you can make an antidote for, for a nettle sting from a nettle. Um, I've actually, I've got some tinctures here. Pass that around if anyone wants to try it. Um, so it's a bulk vodka, obviously, because it's a tincture, so just a couple of drops. I've had personally really good success. I've got a few people down who have it for AC um, I had a friend of mine who I was, we were out having something to eat, and her son's um, dairy intolerant. And um, we had a burger. We think it was the buns, because in, in hindsight, they looked really pretty ashy. Anyway, but I, I've never seen it. It's a really horrific reaction, you know. Oh, awful. So we had to rush off and she was going home to get in the Puritan and I just ran in and she dropped me off and said, give me this and they phoned me 20 minutes later and they're like, I can't believe it, he's like literally back to normal. Um, and he, was, uh, he advised me that I should go and send it So yeah, I'll pass it around and you can have a few. But, but yeah, back to the, the oh, digress a bit there, the, the sting. Um, so it's got histamine and it's actually got serotonin um, and it's also got formic acid in, um, and um, tripotamine. Um, so many of those are smooth muscle stimulants. So that's where you get, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of um, the um, whipping with nettles, which apparently the Romans did, because I think they were freezing them. <laughs> Seriously, and so they would um, hit themselves with the nettles, that's how we ended up with the Roman nettle here. Um, and apparently, sort of in the Middle Ages, people used to whip naughty children with nettles. And apparently, naughty husbands as well. <laughs> <laughs> with nettles, yeah. um, so, in terms of herbal use, then, for herbal medicine, um, nettle is astringent. <coughs> 
So it's drying, it's drawing, um, um, so astringents can also, you know, help with mucous membranes, um, anything like sort of diarrhea, um, profuse sweating, anything like that. Um, it's also diuretic. Um, so yeah, you sort of flush you out in that way, elimination of fluid, um, helping um, kidneys to kind of renew themselves. Um, and it has been traditionally used as a tonic for many years, you know, to, um, spring tonics was something that was quite traditionally done um, around the 17th century time of Paul Pepper. And in fact, in a lot of Europe, it, 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 they still do do it, they still collect spring greens. Um, and nettle is one of the things that would have, they would have been putting in the tonic, um, as you can see from all the um, vitamins uh, that I mentioned earlier, you know, really, really beneficial that time of year. Um, and you see then, they would have gone through that period of um, <laughs> the food they would have eaten in winter is what they would have stored, the kind of very salty meat, fish, things like that. So they really needed that flush out of the system in spring, where I would suggest that really with the diets a lot of people have all times of year, <laughs> nowadays that flushing yourself out like that, you know, beneficial. Um, it's also a pain-killing herb. I have used it on nettle sting because it does, it does work. It does work too. Amazing. Um, so yeah, because it can, it's a pectoral, it can help strengthen and heal the respiratory system. Um, it can increase blood flow and circulation, which again is um, why it's indicated for um, rheumatism, things like that. Um, uh, it's also, yeah, as I said, it's astringent and acidic. It's just another word that it will help bleeding stop when applied topically. Um, uh, nutritive, uh, anti allergenic, I mentioned that. I don't want to get too like, boring with just listing you a load of herbal things that. Uh, <laughs> Um, antimicrobial, I think it's quite interesting because as, as I said, I use it in the garden as an antifungicide, but I also make a multi-surface cleaner out of it so it can be used in the home. So that's another element of, um, you know, cutting out the chemicals in terms of the things you're using to clean in the home. So I just tend to make that with the nettle soap. Um, Myself. Yeah, do make a nettle soap as well. So this is body soap, face soap, um, just made from olive oil, caustic soda, and distilled water. And it's got the nettle in and a bit of aloe vera. But then I can go on to grate that and make it into multi-surface cleaner. So we use green tea. Um, it's one of Sue's recipes actually. Sue's a lady. I don't know if any of you have come across this. She works around Birmingham. Um, with Pasha Pura, and they make a lot of herbs and soaps and it was her who taught us how to make the soap so um, yeah and interestingly it's what's known as an adaptogen so <coughs> these are herbs that increase the body's resistance to biological, emotional, environmental or physical stresses and promenade, promote optimal physiological function um, so, which is, um, you see it's got the serotonin in there, I mean, it's just basically all these bits working together and why, especially the C, they're saying it's beneficial for the adrenals. Um, and what they've actually looked at in, um, with the roots, because as day to day, not really herbalists, but you know, we do stuff with the herbs, we don't really use the root massively, apart from the dye. Um, but they have studied it for prostate cancer, and apparently it is very, very effective. And that is to do with it restoring cell function and stopping spread and restoring cell function. So yeah, it's been used for literally thousands of years. Um, it's been recorded in the crates for 160 BC. Um, they were reporting 61 remedies using nettle. nettle um, a lot of them in those days, um, platicanus, was using um, nettle with hemp or cannabis. That, but the, the old herbalists actually did that quite a lot. They're quite beneficial, used together. Um,
Cold pepper, he used it extensively. In fact, in his book, it says nettles are so well known, they need no description. Description. They may be found by feeding in the darkest night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, as I said, I've got a lot of the modern scientific reports, so a lot of what these herbal herbalists were using it for have gone on to be actually verified by scientific study. Um, so, and obviously the kind of the prostate cancer one being pretty amazing. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, so by, by herbalists, nettle is considered to be a dry herb um, and so oh well, I'm repeating myself I'm just going to skip that bit right um, yeah I think I've covered nettles as herbs I've not <laughs> um, right I'm going to move on and talk oh I've got this this is um, actually nettle in honey nettle seed so again this is something people someone's feeling a bit fatigued or something like that then I tend to suggest that they may try some of that and Honey, of course, as well, is an amazing preservative, so it will keep for, well, apparently, millions of years, if they say the archaeologists were digging stuff up with finding it in honey, so I'll pass it around. I mean, it's not the world's most appetising looking. I think if you're eating wild stuff, that's kind of something that you tend to, uh, so I don't know, can I pass it around like that? Perhaps people can. I mean, you mostly taste the honey, but yeah, the nettle will be there to give you the kind of energy to it. Really. Um, so the other thing that we do with the nettle is fibre. Um, again, um, it's got a long history of use, probably since prehistoric times, I think, as alternatives to flax um, and processed similarly to flax and hemp. Um, historically, it's been used for both uh, fishing nets, thread. Um, it, 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 again, it's a bit of a grey area because archaeologists they can't really tell the difference between hemp nettle and flax without chemical testing. So you find a lot of old fabrics that are found are probably, but what that means, it could be any, you know. Um, so there's, I don't know if anyone has heard of the uh, Bronze Age textile which was found in Denmark, which was, that was originally assumed to be flax until it was examined and that is made from nettle fibre, um, not flax. Um, it was extensively believed to be used in the Saxon times and that would have been um, spun with a drop spindle. Um, in Poland, nettle thread was used till the 17th century until it was replaced by silk. Um, Nettle pulp then continued to be produced in Scandinavia and also Scotland. It was produced quite extensively, uh, where it was called Scotch cloth. The German army uniforms were made from nettle during the First World War due to a shortage of cotton. Um, it was looked into by the British in World War II as well, um, but however, they only ended up using it as a dye for camouflage nets. Um, but it does actually make a really effective dye. Some food colouring will be nettle. I think it is E123. Um, they use spirulina a lot as well for green food colouring, but um, they do use it, produce it commercially for that use. Um, so, yeah, the, the reason nettle's good is because it's a perennial, um, so it can be propagated um, vegetatively rather than just sown for seed, and um, so it can go six weeks in a greenhouse, then you can transplant cuttings into the field. Um, you wouldn't get crop on the first year because the plants need to establish, but afterwards then you could be harvesting to fibre those plants year on year. Um, and the yield in the second year would be uh, between 1.5 and 2.5 metric tonnes per hectare. Um, and then third and fourth year that would go on to four tonnes. Um, do, you know, do you know that compares to hemp? Um, that is, I'm, oh, I'm not sure, Andrew, if you know, I don't want to say, I have to check that. <laughs> I think I'll just be slightly making it up. Um, it, that is one of the reasons it isn't hugely commercially produced because it doesn't have such a high yield per hectare, certainly as flax, I know that. Um, and you see what happened, 
sort of with the advent of cotton was that you know it was just again it's kind of ethics out the window and that's just easier to produce cheaper doesn't matter about the workforce or the environment you know so um yeah um, but i mean you'd need 40 kilos to make one shirt so that's a hectare of nettles called in its third year of production provide fiber for 100 shirts um, and then there's all sorts of byproducts and um, sugar starch protein um, ethanol alcohol. Um, I have got some to show you. You can make paper from metal as well. This is metal. Um, this is actually what I've harvested myself and then attempted to start practicing spinning. So this is the green outer um, part of the stem. Um, I know, you know what I said, like, you know what I'm talking about, so I said, you know what I'm talking, don't talk to me, I'm talking to people. Yeah, do you remember that? <laughs> um, so, yeah, basically, what you do is you need to rep the stems, so you would look for the highest stems you can, or the straightest stems you can, and um, then you can rep them, which is basically rot control rotting. So, uh, commercially, sometimes it's done by chemical method, but you can do it by water, so you would put the stems in water for about two weeks um, and then bring them out and let them dry. Or you can dew wet them, which will take slightly longer, more like six weeks um, in the grass. And then, yeah, once they've dried out, you just um, split the stems, it's called scrunching, crack up all the insides, and then what comes out of the insides is that the woody pith from inside, but you can then go on to make um, paper, paper mache from these, or even, or that I came across a really random, you come across these really random things with nettles, they're actually looking at using these in um, car meetings. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping to <coughs> get some, put that one on as well, so that's the nettle fibre. So yeah, you go on then to when you've taken the green off, to scrunch hardy off like you would with wool. I don't know if you could wear uh, how that works. They're basically just like big massive cat brushes, and then you've got the green stem. And uh, you can see when you look, you see there's a little bit of green, there's a little bit of the remnants of the stem. So you just keep brushing it up and brushing it up. It's awesome. It's amazing. Like, and you make compost and you open the bottom, and I still, after all these years, go, oh my god, I can't believe that's happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, really, if you're going to be trying to produce nettle fibre, that's what I'd really like to get a little kind of project off the ground. Um, but it needs to be done by cuttings, um, because they don't, um, you know, being a wild plant, it's variable how they're going to be produced from seed. Um, so yeah, reasons for production, there, as mentioned there with the method, you know, it uses a lot less water in its production than cotton. Cotton uses quite high, um, high uh, water. Um, consumer awareness of toxic residues in textiles, that's a whole other side of it, you know, it has a very negative impact and a need for alternatives to conventional textile chain. I actually did fashion design when I left school. Um, and that was one of the reasons I didn't sort of continue in it really because it is quite a very big industry, you know, the people cost as well as the environmental cost. It's one that doesn't necessarily get talked about quite as much as some of the other. Well, we've got so many of them, I suppose, you know. Um, so, and then there's also obviously because, you know, cotton, it's, there's extensive pesticide use, all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really viable as an alternative, just not on a very large scale, which is where, you know, the crooks of it is really. Okay, so yeah, what I should probably say, you can get um, things made commercially by Nettle. There's a great report, again I've got it on my mega in the cloud file, so um, 
uh, it was done, there's been a lot of research in Germany, Austria and Finland on this subject and that report really goes into depth, so that's in the file. Um, if you do find stuff commercially, I think you usually find it comes from the Himalayas, um, <coughs> places like that, and it's actually a different type of nettle. It's a nettle that grows, well it's called the Himalayan nettle, and it grows wild in Africa, several Asian countries, and again, long history in those parts of the world are being made into cordage and um, string, or a bit <coughs> um, And Raymi is another one. In fact, I've got some lovely cushions I've got from IKEA, and they're made of Raymi. Um, and Raymi, again, is an Asian um, nectar that's grown extensively in China. Um, I did try and find a bit more information from IKEA, but I knew the start getting a bit suspicious. I was like, where's this? Where did you just come from? And they start, they were quite friendly at first, but then they got a bit like, oh, again, don't go anymore now. <laughs> um, this is a very little little piece. I mean, again, you see these things, you know, they take a lot of time, but that took ages <laughs> to make. And it's funny talking in terms of, you know, social connection, because these are the sorts of things that people would sat around together doing. You know, like soap making, soap making takes four hours making it by hand, and they're the kind of things that people would have sat together, chatted, done together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where a lot of the separation comes in. It's, it's a bit more fun, I think, but this is called Barge, nevertheless. Um, so yeah, Raimi, Eastern Asia, um, and that doesn't actually sing, which is probably one of the benefits of things in the, <laughs> the production process. Um, and yeah, they found it as far back as um, wrapping for mummies. In Egypt. Um, so yeah, if you do find it commercially sold, it would generally be made from Raymi or the Himalayan nettle. Um, how long have I been talking for? <laughs> You're back about two, three minutes. I've got what? Two, about two, three minutes. Oh my god, okay. Well, <laughs> I, have, I did put that there to check. I'll get carried away, you see, because I really love nettles. <laughs> um, right, what I'll do, I've got a little bit on um, mythology and magic and folklore, because in literature, because there's loads of references there as well, it's quite interesting. I'll whip through that quick, and then I'll just tell you about our nettle festival. And I've also, this is just what nettle tied it for me, is our community seed bank, because it's part of the permaculture. Um, group, we just run in the free community seed banks of the seeds there just to so people want to have a look and um, before they go and just help yourselves. And um, the idea is just to get people growing stuff basically. Um, so, yeah, Nettle's got loads of really crazy names like old English names, Net Devil's Apron, Naughty Man's Plaything, Hokey <laughs> <laughs> Pokey, um, Jenny Nettle's Sting Leaf, Devil's Leaf. Hegbeck, which is quite my favourite. Um, and nettle is actually, now I quite like, this is a train thought I've had with it. Nettle is very synchronistic to man because it needs nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. And man creates soil with a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in it. We just do that. <coughs> you can actually look, there's um, some good footage of aerial photographs in the Highlands of Scotland. Can you please not do that, Nettle? I know you're a bit bored now. I've nearly finished. Um, and um, you can see that they will go, they will see vast swathes of nettle, then they will go dig there and there were human settlements and it's because we have created that soil that is perfect for it to grow then. Um, but in, in terms of magic, I mean regardless of whether you believe or you don't believe these types of things, I just think as a literature, as a historical, as a cultural thing, you know, it's interesting. But it was believed to be the magic of mothering, really, I guess, because of its bounty of nutrition. Um, so she kind of offers us the building blocks we need to be strong and healthy individuals. In fact, yeah, that's another thing that could seem to be described as being tasty and a bit akin to um, breast milk, mother's milk. And that probably is true because I remember from breastfeeding the kids again, it's that iron content, I think. Um, so yeah, what they say is nettle is nettle in your life reminds you to take time to nourish yourself at the most basic level. Um, but then of course it has the sting. Um, but really, with the sting, what they say is that the nettle there is asking you to recognise and honour the worth of what she gives, um, which I think you know across the board in society is something that's prevalent really. 
and if you're willing to hazard a sting to gain the nettle, you know, you're more likely to value what you've taken. Um, so, um, yeah, it's kind of in that term, it's not, and um, ensure you and those around you who might benefit from your work, you know, recognise and value your contribution. Um, so, yeah, Nettle's totem animal is actually a serpent, which is probably only interesting to me because that's another train of thought that I've uh, been having. Just put it anywhere on there, darling. So, um, yeah, so really, I suppose the point there, this is the point I wanted to get across to everyone to say, that it is a venomous plant and it's got a fierce sting, it can't be plucked easily, but it teaches the lesson of transmutation. So, you know, it appears antagonistic, but once assimilated, it's totally beneficial. So, you know, it's kind of that lesson in your own life of taking something that seems completely awful and then just changing it around into something else. Um, you know, it can be um, taken as a tea. People working through spiritual or emotional ordeals will take the nettle tea as kind of that sort of power. So it's that, you know, I really think there is a massive synchronistic relationship between humans and nettles. Um, yeah, I better wrap it up there. There is some other kind of lines of research that has got benefits in soil remediation as well, so which I've got time to go into. But again, if you are new, you can look up the stuff we're doing on Sandman Birmingham Permaculture Network. Uh, that's our website. And we're also on fa uh, Facebook as the Sandman Birmingham Permaculture Network. Um, and we are having a Nettle Festival next year. Um, unfortunately, we have to cancel this year's, but 20, 20th of May, and it's going to be at Martinier Gardens, which is in Edgebaston. I don't know if anyone's aware. Do you know Martinier Gardens? Anyway, you should go there anyway, then. It's like um, it's a bit like a hippie version of the Botanical <laughs> Gardens. It's free entry. Um, you don't have to pay to get in there, and they do lots of amazing work. They've got some fairly well established woodland because it's been. Um, in trust for a number of years um, and yeah so we'll be holding the Nettle Festival there so if anyone wants to get involved in any way I mean it's a community festival in essence there's the Nettle on the one hand and as I hope you can see from some of the stuff I said there the community is a massive part of it and I think that the, the Nettles and we're familiar anyway and the community thing is integral so it really becomes what those who come contribute make it so you like and do something. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you.